Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast in which we explore all things to do with the Beatles as a group, as soloists, past, present, future, if we can figure it out. Uh, I'm Alan Cozen, and I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you may know also as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. How's it going? Pretty good. Uh, Steve Marinucci, who for many, many years covered the Beatles for the examiner.com website and now is a frequent contributor about the Beatles and other things to Billboard and access.com. That's access as in AXS.com. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. And Al Sussman, the executive editor of Beatle Fan, and one of the forces that keep things running smoothly and interestingly at the Fest for Beatle Fans, which is coming up. Hello, Al. Hi, Alan. Hello there, everybody. And this week we basically are going to cover one big subject, but before we get to that, there's a couple of tiny news things, uh, maybe not so tiny. Uh, Ken saw Paul McCartney again last night. Um, how many times on this tour, Ken? <laughs> is, <laughs> is that only the second? My okay. second, and that will be it. Oh, okay. Um, Although I'm, so- I must say, my wife has been pressuring me to see him in D.C., and the reason why is because she saw the Beatles on August 15th at D.C. Stadium. So that uh-huh. was right around the time, 50 years yeah. ago. Well. You know, so... You never uh, know. I might be <laughs> making yeah. another trip. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I mean, when when the wives want to do something, especially if it's something we would normally want to do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, <laughs> it always makes sense to do it. I, uh, I so sense. how was it? It was a good show. I mean, I think um, having come off the show at Fenway Park, where I was really blown away by... You know, the thing that we're so concerned about, Paul's voice, where I thought he really was in tip-top shape there and near flawless. Um, I think that he was struggling a bit uh, at the show in New Jersey. Um, But still, it's real difficult to gauge these things because to people who don't go as often as I do, they loved it. You know, they Mm -hmm. thought it was a terrific show. And even if I look at Facebook and I see a lot of the posts, people will say it was an amazing show and Paul sounded great. Um, I think the one thing that impresses me the most about, well, what impressed me the most about this show is that even though I felt that his voice wasn't as strong, he mustered through it in a way where he still managed to tackle the songs fairly well. And one case in point really was here today. Because right before he introduced the song and he's telling uh, the audience why he wrote the song, his voice was really strained. Mm-hmm. And I said to myself, he, he may not make it through this song. And mm. somehow he did a very good job, you know, without really hearing too much hoarseness or strain at all. So he's able to manipulate his voice to do whatever's necessary. He's a pro. He's been doing this all these years. Sometimes when you don't have your best stuff and you're able to do a good job, that's just as impressive as putting on a good show anyway. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it was still a tremendous show. Uh, I was kind of wondering, uh, and I was talking to Tom Franjone, who was at the, the show as well, before it, you know, it's New Jersey, who might be showing up? <laughs> you know, I was thinking maybe Bruce might be there, or Little Steven, there were no special guests, but it mm. still was a tremendous show. You know, there's one thing I didn't mention when I talked about the Fenway show, which is that since we're so used to all the introductions that Paul has said, <laughs> and it shows um, he is bringing in something new, which is he talks about You Won't See Me. Hmm. And before he, he talks about the song, he says, you know, you wonder how the inspiration comes to writing certain songs. And he was just playing the chords of You Won't See Me on the guitar. And he was just telling, you know, the audience, these are the chords I came up with. And it led to You Won't See Me. So he's playing the chords for a while and then he goes right into the song, which I thought was a nice little touch because it was really something new. So Mm -hmm. um, one thing that, and I'd like to ask our listeners if they've seen Paul on this tour, if he's done this. You remember that quote that Paul said when he was interviewed in England about, um, and Paul Weller asked him the question about 
how do you handle the fact that you know a lot of people just want to hear your old mm. stuff and he <laughs> brought up the whole thing about the beatles and that a lot of people when he does beatles songs they hold up their their cell phones and the light show and then there's a big mm -hmm. black hole there's a black hole when he does the solo stuff he brought that up during this show and he said you know the band and i are watching you and we know that when we do beatles songs the lights are up and when we do the, sol the solo stuff that they're not and i was <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny to you. That's it's got to hurt a little bit if you're the artist. And then Paul said, "But we're going to do those songs anyway." I I I don't think he's really taking it all that seriously. I think he's just using that as part of the you know the banter that he does, you know the between song banter, you know, along with know. you know. Let me take I the jacket so, off and, and drink it all Beatles, in. And... The Beatles songs are his songs too, you know. So it's not like yeah. Yeah, he's saying, okay, that. you like some of my songs more than you like some of my other songs. Okay, fine. You know, you've known them longer. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think he's, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it, if it's something that hurts him or not. I mean, it, it's, it's all, I think he's, I think that, unless I'm misremembering this, I think one of the points he was making when, when Paul Weller asked in, in a way is that, you know, it's all his stuff. So, mm -hmm. you right. know. Yeah. That's the way I see it. Yeah. You know? But um, anything yeah. change in the set, Ken? Not at all. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, in fact, my wife was saying to me, it's a shorter show. And in fact, it was two and a half hours, whereas it's usually close to three. But having come off see seeing the show in Fenway, he did Helter Skelter, at oh, Fenway, which apparently, you know, he hasn't done in the other shows. You'd have to check all the different shows, the set list. Mm. But he didn't do it at this show. So mm -hmm. I think that he just did a typical set list, and in at Fenway Park he just did one extra song. So mm -hmm. he hasn't been changing his set list lately at all. Um, yeah. He, in fact, he wiped out the second encore. There is no second encore anymore. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, that's actually from last year, mm -hmm. where he, I guess, decided to just do just the one kind of elongated encore rather than come back and do a second encore. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He comes Might back be. with the American flag and, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, it was a great show. You know, the, the crowd loved it. Um, I do think that the crowd in Boston was far more appreciative than the one in how, New Jersey. How uh, was the weather? Weather was perfect. <laughs> you know, it was hot during the day, but it was nice and cool at night. And it wasn't even muggy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was exactly the way you'd want it. So, um, you know, it's a great show. I just feel privileged to see him. Because, like I said, he, he doesn't have to do this. And, uh, why, why do you think the audience in Jersey wasn't uh, quite as appreciative as they were in Boston? From what I observed, I think that this crowd, they were, they were pumped when it came to all the Beatles songs. I saw a lot of people get up out of their seats when he did the non beatles songs. Um, mm -hmm. certainly not the real classic ones like Band on the Run, everybody got up sure. for it and Live and Let Die. And, mm -hmm. uh, I did see a lot of people get up for High, High, High. They really liked it because it really is a great rock song to do live, mm -hmm. especially towards the end of the show, kind of where it belongs. I just think that the people in Boston, it's, it's a, it's a bigger Beatle crowd. <laughs> I've heard about this for years about people in Boston and whenever I've seen Paul at Fenway Park and it's now four times I just think the crowd there it's just from the feedback of everybody that's sitting down you know they just they really love him there's so many people mm -hmm. getting up and, and and you know singing along with the songs I mean it there are times when and I said this when I reviewed Fenway it's kind of annoying to hear the crowd sing so much. Yeah, you were, remember you were saying that. You know, yeah. I want to hear Paul sing. But it's <laughs> also interesting to know, you know what songs really get them going. Oh, Blah, Dio, oh, Blah, Da gets everybody up. And it's such a, you know, I was saying years ago, why did it take so long for him to do this in his set list? It's such a perfect <laughs> song to do live. But I just think that the crowd's more appreciative there for whatever the reason. Um, I just think that the people in New Jersey mainly wanted to hear the Beatles stuff. I don't think that they were as excited <laughs> for his other songs. You know, when he does My Valentine, a lot of people get up. And it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they don't like it. It just means that if you're going to go to the bathroom or get a drink, you're going to do mm -hmm. it during a song that you don't know. So yeah. um, just picture yourself in Paul's shoes and you see that. It's, it's got to get you a little bit, you know? 
Hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so Ken, you also had an item about a billboard list that you wanted to discuss. Yeah, it's just something that I saw online a couple of weeks ago, and I posted on on my Facebook page. It was just an interesting list from Billboard magazine, and I'm really a big chart buff through the years. I know, you know, where all the Beatles singles and solo Beatles singles peak, and I've studied that for God knows how long, since the 70s. Mm -hmm. But um, this particular list was really different because what it did was it combined the singles and albums charts from 1958 on, and it told you who the top 100 artists are from, you know, the beginning of the rock era, although it's debatable when the rock era started, but since 1958 on, and it was just a very interesting list because anyone who would look at this would probably be shocked based on whatever their musical tastes are and how they were brought up in radio because Mm -hmm. you take an artist who was primarily an album artist, like Led Zeppelin, for example, who, although they had a few hit singles, like Whole Lot of Love, you know, all their albums did really well. Same Mm -hmm. thing with Pink Floyd, who had a few hits. Those two artists are nowhere in the top 100. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, It's it's shocking. And yet uh, the Beatles, I'm sure everyone's waiting to hear, the Beatles were number one. And Paul McCartney, as a solo artist, is number 11, which I think Mm -hmm. is really impressive. But... um, The reason why I wanted to bring that up is because there was a show that we did, uh, it's probably at least a year ago, when we were talking about the biggest artists of the 70s. And for some reason, Al, you were mentioning Mm -hmm. that in your mind, the Eagles and Led Zeppelin were the biggest acts of of the 70s. And sometimes people don't think in terms of singles and albums combined. Yeah. I'll I'll give you a perfect example of that. The number 20 artist on this list is Olivia Newton-John. Uh-huh. <laughs> that and you know, I mean she had a lot of she had a lot of hit records in the 70s and early 80s, but that's uh, that's pretty impressive that she would be the, you know, in terms of chart performance, the yeah. number 20 artist on this yeah. on this list. But it also and, yeah. tells you that she did mm-hmm. well with her albums too. Cuz she, uh, yeah. she wouldn't have ranked that high if she if she wasn't number 20. Yeah. So, you know, some people take lists uh, and and uh well they may not take it so seriously um if you're a chart buff i mean this might be a more realistic look at who the biggest artists were you know i don't know how much hits mean to you or albums mean to you which is more important but when you combine the two i think it's a more realistic look and the fact that paul made it to number 11 is pretty darn impressive so um what about the other three solo beatles where did they appear nowhere Nope. Really? Which is a shame. Huh. You know, so in though, some... Yeah, they did very well with their albums, and they all had a sizable amount of hits, but not a, you know, a long string of hits the way Paul did. Mm-hmm. So there's some alternate universe with John Lennon, Pink Floyd, and Led Zeppelin, um, you know, where they reign the chart. On... <laughs> <laughs> well, until but, Bill Ward uh... comes out with that. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, though. Well... Yeah. well were the, the Eagles e- on it? The Eagles are at number 62. 62, okay. <laughs> and and, and, and the, the ironic thing is that the, in terms of, again, of, of chart performance, we're not doing, you know, not sales because they're always too vague, but in terms of chart performance, the most successful artist of this decade this second decade of the uh of this uh this century is also not on this list and that's adele hmm. uh, she's released three albums the first album did okay 19 did okay the the second and third 20 21 and 25 have been phenomenons but you know, because of the brevity of her you know of at least of her catalog and her chart runs uh she's not on this list either so it's uh it's it's really interesting interesting how about taylor swift oh she's Uh, way up there i think it's 34 i think mm -hmm. i mean madonna is number two Uh, (laughs) uh. hey hey you know uh, this is a sore subject with you al (laughs) oh yes 
Yeah. I, I, well, I, you know, I, I, I have to, you know, grudgingly say that, you know, give the, give the devil her due, you know, she certainly has had a, you know, a long career and has uh, reinvented herself in uh, who knows how many ways, but, uh, you know, uh, she's just not to my, my taste. Yeah. Taylor, well, the, Taylor, Swift, okay. Taylor Swift is 87. Uh, she is at 34. 34. Are we looking at the at a different list? No, I'm looking at the uh, the list that, that Ken sent. Yeah, Al's right. Yeah. But I brought up Madonna because many years ago on my show on WDHA when Al was a guest, we were talking about Madonna. <laughs> this seems to be one of the few things that sticks out in my memory from all those years of the things that you said. And you said to me, she's a flash in the pan. Yeah, and I was absolutely wrong. Yeah. You know, as I said, she's she's been able to, you know, reinvent herself in any number of ways, and has uh, uh, had a you know she's let's face it, you know, it's over thirty years, mm-hmm. and I mean she doesn't really have hit records anymore, but she's still she's still a big concert draw, so you know, it's. Uh, uh, you know, not to my taste, but uh, you know, give uh, okay, give her, give her her due. <laughs> well, can I just read the top ten for anyone? Yeah, that's sure, here? sure. Okay, number ten is the Rolling Stones. Mm. Number nine is Whitney Houston. Mm. Number eight is Michael Jackson. Number seven, which is a huge shock to me. Yeah. Janet Jackson. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ahead of Michael Jackson. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's very surprising. Stevie Wonder is number six. You kind of expected mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, number five is Mariah Carey. Number four is Elvis Presley. Number three is Elton John. Yeah. Number two, Madonna. And number one, the Beatles. But the fact yeah, okay. that, Paul, that Paul's number 11, it just tells you the consistency of the success of his albums. Because even though his singles haven't done well for a long time, he still mm-hmm. makes the top 10 every few years with, ev- with every new album. So yeah. that really adds to it. You know, all the longevity and the success on both singles and albums. Okay, well, so fascinating as that is, and uh, I, I'm suspecting that all four to, of us... To were... at least, fascinating to at least two of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> two of you. right. And, and yet, given the choice between talking about Madonna and our actual topic of the week, <laughs> I'm suspecting that all four of us are in, in agreement uh, that we'll move on to the topic yes. now. Yes. Sort of an anniversary topic. We don't always cover anniversaries because, you know, there's like an anniversary every week at this point, you know, for something. But uh, it is the 50th anniversary this week of the release of Revolver, and that's big because Revolver is a hugely significant album in the Beatles catalog, and yet it's only been in, I think, relatively recent times that everybody has almost unanimously realized how huge it is. Um, And and in fact, actually, I've been reading this week a lot of the, you know, there have been encomiums to Revolver all over the place. Esquire just did one, um, a really good one. Rolling Stone did a a really good one. Epiphone. Did one. Yeah. I did. I did one. Right. Epiphone's mm-hmm. website, you know, that made the Epiphone Casino guitar that they played uh, during that period. John and George both played them. Um, and Paul probably played them too. I think. Even on their webpage, they have article devoted to the anniversary of Revolver. And uh, you know, and I think Jeff Slate, uh, for for one, makes the point that um, it really wasn't until relatively recently that we began thinking of it as something special. And mm. I think that's kind of never really thought about it that way because it had always, to me, been you know, it's one of the Beatles albums. I mean, you know, they're they're all special, but. I think he's right in a way that it, it's it's been elevated in recent times. Um, you know, it always was that that Pepper was the one that that stood out, and now you have this sort of um, you know Robert Rodriguez in his book. You know, basically the first thing he says is everyone sort of looks at Pepper, but Revolver is the greater album. Mm. Um, Matter uh, of fact, about uh, I think it was about twenty years ago that Bill King 
did a cover piece in Beetle Fan in which he talked about Revolver being the, you know, the best of all Beatles albums. And at that time, that was, uh, you know, that was a debatable topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, but there's I've listened to it, I think, three or four times in this past week, getting ready for the show in mono and stereo and whatever. (laughs) And and, uh, you know, yeah, it really is a great album, I've got to say. Never really focused on it in in quite the same way before in terms of is this the greatest greatest Beatles album? And I'm still not sure. I have a hard Mm. time picking a greatest Beatles album, you know? Mm. But it sure has a lot of good stuff on it. I mean, track Mm -hmm. by track it's just incredible so why don't we start with steve and uh... (laughs) okay i i don't fall into the it's the greatest beatles album um group um I, i mean i've always been i've always gone along with those who say pepper is the greatest because it was such a big advance I'm not going to uh, – I would definitely say, though, that the gulf between Rubber Soul and Revolver and Revolver and Pepper was pretty immense. I mean, they they both were, uh, you know, big advances, um, and you couldn't have done Revolver without doing pe- – or doing Pepper without doing Revolver. There's no question. Mm-hmm. Um, there is – I mean, there are some, there are some great things. Uh, I mean, the – the I guess maybe the most amazing, one of the most amazing is Tomorrow Never Knows. I mean that's just obvious. But I mean, I was listening to the strings only thing on uh, Eleanor Rigby today, and that's just absolutely gorgeous. I've always loved the the uh, guitar solo on And Your Bird Can Sing. I absolutely think that's one of George's mm-hmm. big moments. But yeah, I think that's one of the best things. You know the best things there is. I mean, there, there's just some. There are. Got to get you into my life has always been, you know, one of my favorite songs. Uh, you know, um, I mean, there's so many. There's so many things to talk about. The, the fact that George has three songs on that album mm-hmm. uh, is, you know, is very, you know, I mean, that was a big step up for him. There's just a lot of things all together that uh, that make it great. But I wouldn't. I would not fall into the category of those who, who say this is the greatest album because I don't. Uh, I, I can't say that. Like you, like you said, Alan. I can't. Yeah. yeah. There's just. Uh, I, I still think Pepper probably. If you have to vote a greater album, a greatest album, Pepper would get the nod from me. But I mean, I'm not gonna. Uh, I acknowledge this is this is still a great album. So. Hmm. Okay, um, Al. It's it's interesting what what Steve was just saying about about Sergeant Pepper. In fact, I think Robert Rodriguez makes the point in um, in Jeff Slate's uh, article about the fact that when Revolver was released, uh, there basically wasn't any rock rock press as of yet. In mm-hmm. fact, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, in those days, there was a there was a music store freebie that was uh, tied to radio stations around the country called Go Magazine. Oh, yes. Uh, in, New oh, York, yeah. in New York, it was tied to WMCA. And mm-hmm. they did a review of Revolver uh, right about the time it came out. And their review, their entire review of Tomorrow Never Knows was great for dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, <laughs> you're kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Which wow. shows you just how unprepared I think a lot of people were for this album. In fact, um, I remember playing it for friends um, and uh, you know at the time, and they were some of them were were not real thrilled. This was yeah. there was a fair amount of uh, kind of fan blowback at that point, you know, kind of negative negative blowback. I think Where Candy, it, Candy mm-hmm. Leonard discusses that in her book yes. too. I think mm-hmm. she says very much so. Scared by it, yeah, and uh, especially some of the younger the younger fans, which in fact made the monkeys uh, emergence all the more easier because 
the Beatles were no longer the cuddly four jolly mop tops to some of the younger fans. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. Know? Oh yeah, I uh, remember. I remember that very well. I mean, that yeah. that was a that was a that was very crucial, especially. Yeah, I mean, even even earlier than that. I mean, uh, I remember. I remember listening to I was listening to WABC one afternoon. They were playing Strawberry Fields, and Dan Ingram, of all people, was criticizing. Well, his, that that would be later. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. I mean, there was there was all that kind of blow. I mean, that that kind of thing, you know, was was a big issue. There was there were a lot of people that had trouble that, with the Beatles' uh, progressions. Right. Um, yeah, well, yeah. you know, I mean, they hadn't put out albums with songs that would say things like, I know what it's like to be dead. You yeah, know? And exactly. What group was doing that? You know, it's 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 completely out there. Yeah. Um, it's so, true, it's, you know, especially for a group of their of their stature, because by that point they were so far above any competition that uh, that basically anything they did. Uh, was you know was you know was examined fairly uh, uh, fairly carefully by uh, you know especially the fans, and and in some cases they you know some of the uh, fans whose you know maybe whose uh, musical palette wasn't all that ad- adventurous, uh, they were kind of scared off by these kind of quote unquote weird songs that John was doing and this mm-hmm. Indian music that uh, yeah. that George was doing that that sort of thing you know so there was so there was some you know some at least contemporaneous uh, fan fan blowback you know whereas the following year when Sergeant Pepper came out not only was there a you know kind of an embryonic uh, rock press and there was FM rock radio in certain in certain areas, uh, but also even some of the mainstream magazines like Time and Newsweek reviewed it on, you know, as a, you know, as a serious work, as mm-hmm. not just, you know, oh, these, uh, you know, these, these teenage, uh, you know, rock and rollers uh, with, what, you know, whatever junk they're putting out now, they, uh, they actually showed some actual serious appreciation for it. And that was also around the same time of the Leonard Bernstein uh, CBS special on the, the new sort of the new rock. Mm-hmm. So there was, so there was a big change there in just uh, in less than a year as right. far as the, you know, the appreciation of the music itself, uh, as far as whether it's the best <laughs> He says postponing the uh, the inevitable <laughs> as much as possible. Um, I don't know that it's the greatest of all Beatles albums. Certainly, Sgt. Pepper is the most important because of its place in history and its place in changing the whole emphasis of the music industry from a singles to an album industry. But there's an awful lot of, and you know, and some people will tell you that the White Album is better. Some people will say that Ar- the Abbey Road is better. Mm-hmm. Some people like me enjoy Rubber Soul more. Hmm. But hmm. it's there's an awful lot of of great great work on here. Uh, some of uh, you know, and especially the musical the musical breath. When you're going from George Harrison doing Indian music to Paul doing uh, R&B, uh, horn-based R&B, and uh, rather sophisticated songs that you know that mm-hmm. were definitely a song like for no one, which is certainly pretty sophisticated stuff for somebody who was at the point that point 25 years old or whatever he was. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, just twenty-three, twenty-three, yeah, yeah, even even more so, and uh, and certainly the the very challenging work that uh, that John Lennon was doing at that point. So, don't know if it's the greatest, but it's uh, it's certainly it's a it's a it's a massively important album. In terms of the challenging work John Lennon was doing, I think it might be worth mentioning to the listeners, at least as a footnote, that Revolver, as we got to know it when it was yes. new, 
didn't have I'm Only Sleeping and Your Bird Can Sing and Dr. Robert. Those had been taken off and put on Yesterday and Today. So we already had the tracks, but we didn't have them in the context. Mm -hmm. And and that makes actually a big difference, I think. For Um, sure. Because I mean, mm-hmm. I'm always sleeping. It is an incredible song. It's really beautiful. It's it's uh, it, it it's another of these songs that gets them into a realm that they hadn't been in before. No one really had been in pop. And your bird can sing. I mean, John always thought it was a throwaway, but uh, I think that's an incredible track. You know, so I mean, those I do those, yeah. those multi-track do. guitars and that's just really something. Doctor Robert, I could I could see saying is a, a throwaway, but even so, it, it's you know it rocks. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And and the mono version. I mean, that was Doctor Robert was one of the first tracks that led me to realize that the mono versions could be significantly different than the stereo versions because the backing vocals on Dr. Robert are much more apparent in mono than in stereo. They do this descending thing, you know, well, 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 you're feeling fine. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you barely hear that on the stereo. It's just lost. But, you know, once I was playing it in mono, I mean, having originally gotten rid of all my mono albums and replaced them with stereo, <laughs> I was playing a British EP that had that had Dr. Robert on it and heard that and said, whoa, what's going on here? Wow. You know, Paul songs on this record. I mean, for God's sake, Eleanor Rigby, here, there mm-hmm. and everywhere for no one got to get you into my life. I mean. It's really something. I mean, and and so when you when you think about um, the John songs being taken off and there being no rock press, mm-hmm. and the fact that Sergeant Pepper we got intact, mm-hmm. it's you know the, all of these things made a difference. I mean, maybe this should have been, you know, as you say, the beginning of album rock. You know, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff here that couldn't, you know, at the time anyway, couldn't possibly be a single. But, you know, was clearly part of a big picture. And we only really got most, but still just part of the picture at the time. Whereas with Pepper, we got it all. And mm-hmm. uh, not okay. only that, but, uh, you know, the Beatles didn't perform any of this stuff during their 66 tour. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, right. That, that comes into play. And they also had to deal with the whole Beatles being bigger than Jesus controversy. <laughs> and there wasn't that much talk about Revolver. Oh, there was virtually there was virtually none. In fact, I heard just yesterday. I heard uh, Andre Gardner on his uh, Sunday morning show play uh, excerpts from an, from an interview that uh, uh, with I think I think with a British um, reporter who was asking him about Revolver, and that's the first time I had ever I think I had ever heard anybody on that tour asking them about Revolver. Right. Because because it was, the whole tour was nothing but, uh, you know, uh, well, are you going to apologize for this terrible statement and all this nonsense? Right. <laughs> but I really think Revolver is an absolutely stunning album. Um, mm. From track one to track 14, every song to me is a winner. Although I could say that, in my opinion, about every Beatles album. But right. what, um, <laughs> what I love amongst the many things about the Beatles is how eclectic they became and how how acceptable it certainly was to me <laughs> to embrace everything from Eleanor Rigby classical elements to love you too of the first full blown indian song and again think about how old george harrison was when he wrote love you too mm-hmm. um what is it 20 23 23 he was for love you too um one of the greatest love songs ever and here there and everywhere all the psychedelic stuff that john was doing sometimes i wonder if by having those three songs being put on yesterday and today, a few months earlier, maybe it made the transition a bit smoother to go into Revolver. It wasn't as shocking when you already have I'm Only Sleeping, something psychedelic like that, to go into uh, Tomorrow Never Knows or She Said, She Said. I don't know. But it, it really is uh, It's fascinating how when the album came out, I mean, obviously it went to number one, like all Beatle albums, but... I was really curious to hear from the three of you what you remember about, you know, the the general impression from Beatle fans. And like you were saying, Al, a lot of people thought this was, you know, way too advanced or, you know, mm-hmm. over their heads. 
Mm-hmm. And you can't find a greater leap from Beatle album to Beatle album than from Rubber Soul to Revolver. Despite what George Harrison said in the Beatles anthology, where he thought that yeah. they were so similar, the only thing really similar is that they were very guitar-based, you know, those two albums. Yes. And uh, the comparison between Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, I think that, um, you know, I talked to Jeff Emmerich about this in an interview, Sgt. Pepper is far more produced and more layered, whereas, you know, if you prefer the more raw sound of the Beatles, Revolver is more for you. I mm-hmm. think that, um, you know, every single track, Enya Burke and Sing has always been one of my favorite Beatles songs, maybe because mm-hmm. I heard it so much in the Beatle cartoons. But yeah. um, the dual uh, guitar parts there being played are just so wonderful. If you listen to that song without the vocals, you just hear the guitars, it's mm-hmm. fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Yellow Submarine is a great children's song. And uh, like you said, three George Harrison songs to open with a George Harrison song. You know, mm-hmm. with Taxman, and what an amazing song that is. And lyrically, the songs were changing so much. And sonically, they were changing with so many different sounds. And Jeff Emmerich applying the close miking technique on so many of the instruments there on that album. But the thing <laughs> is, I'm sure that when you were young and you had probably a very, you know, small little record player, you couldn't hear all that stuff. Oh, of I course think it's not. it's only years later when you when you listen and it's also when it's remastered too. It's like my God, the sounds out of this thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember when we were kids uh, listening to Taxman, and you know, one of the things that uh, you know, it, it's not the most reliable way to get information, but we used to also pour over Beatles records when they came out for anything that we thought might be autobiographical, and mm-hmm. so you know, this this for us was a big lesson in British tax rates. <laughs> you know they take 95 percent tax you know and i th- it, one thing about tax man though when did we find i don't think we knew this at the time i don't think we knew it until probably mark lewison's recording sessions book came out maybe a little earlier but i don't think we knew at the time that that was paul playing lead on georgia no song. i i didn't know that yeah. <laughs> and it's you know really quite a lead too i mean yeah yeah uh, by the way, uh, we were talking about people not mentioning it and and the not being a rock press. I mean, in England there was, and in oh, fact, sure. the British uh, Weekly Disc and Music Echo. I think it was. Oh, I know what you're. Yeah, I know what you're. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I get it. Leading Ray to Davies of oh, the right. Kinks. <laughs> Um, it's funny, though, you know, they have the call out quote that they use almost as the title. Really, it's a load of rubbish right. applied only to Yellow Submarine. It, You know, he pretty much liked everything else. I mean, he thought Taxman was a little simple, but he liked the sound of it. And, you know, he loved And Your Bird Can Sing. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, no, he didn't. I'm uh, only what sleeping. Did he- I'm always <laughs> sleeping. Yeah, that one. He did. Uh, he thought And Your Bird Can Sing was a little predictable. I'm looking at this now. The funny thing about Yellow Submarine, you know, for, for him to be saying this is that, you know, Yellow Submarine has that sort of old timey thing that is right up Ray Davies' alley. You know? mm-hmm. I think maybe it was cutting a little too close to certain of his his things. But uh okay. Yeah, yeah not sure. That, some of the dance hall stuff that Paul does is very, you know, I can see Ray getting into that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although Ray has said that John was his favorite. Yeah. So it's interesting to, just to get any quotes from Ray Davies about the Beatles at all, because, you know, for two of the biggest bands ever, you don't hear the Beatles ever talk about the Kinks. You know, I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's uh, you know, the Beatles had relationships with most of those bands because they played on the same bills yeah. very often. So, but I've never mm-hmm. heard any of the Beatles talk about the Kinks ever, which is shocking to me. You know, yeah. the Stones and the Who, yes, but not the Kinks. So anyway, but good maybe a little sunshine. bit of contemporary rivalry, possibly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, just like Pete Townsend's always been a bit jealous of the Beatles. Yeah, you know, and their success thinking the Who should have had the kind of success the Beatles did. Only the mm-hmm. Beatles came here first, which is why we had the, which is why the Beatles had the success. All because right. of the timing, really. You know, a lot of that's jealousy. Same thing with a lot of things Keith Richards has been saying. Oh, <laughs> I was just going to say that. I mean, Richards can't tell about them. You know, so. Hmm. I like Jeff Slate's responses online to what, uh, <laughs> what Keith's been saying. 
you know, just shut the, uh, you know, up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not sure what, um, you know, I, I've got actually, I should have looked in my files for other British reviews of it um, besides this, because this was just sort of a gimmick, I guess, in a way. Um but uh, yeah, they had they had more of I think a rock press than than yes. we did at the time, right? Because they had two, well, at least two regular had, papers. You know, they had uh, they had Melody Maker and the New Musical Express. Plus, I guess I guess Disc was what sort of like you know their their billboard. Mm. I think. Yeah. So yeah, they had a number of things going, but uh, they were they were a bit of ahead of ahead of us there on that. Um, but yeah, so okay, so Steve would say Sergeant Pepper is his favorite. Al, I'm not sure well, if what you, have, you said you is have, a favorite. Have, well, favorite or the best? What you consider the best, which almost by definition is, wouldn't it be your favorite? Mm, not, not necessarily. necessarily. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to Steve then, because Steve was demurring, I think. All right. What would you say is the best, and what would you say is your favorite? If they're different, well, the, my favorite has to be Abbey Road. The best happen, has to be Sergeant Pepper. Hmm. Okay, Al. Well, my favorite is uh, I, I'm, is definitely Rubber Soul. Either version, I'll take either either the U.S. or the U.K. version. As far as the best album, boy, note for note. Uh, um, I think I think very possibly it is Revolver. Mm-hmm. You know, you broke down the uh, the the songs just before, and it's it's a it's a very impressive list. And so, uh, while Abbey Road and the White Album are both brilliant albums, as is Sgt. Pepper, of course. Uh, but note for note, it very well may be Revolver. Ken. Okay. Well, my favorite for a long time has been Abbey Road, mainly because um, nothing compares to side two of Abbey Road. The yeah. whole medley, I mean, how they all worked together so well and flowed together so well is one of the great miracles of the mm-hmm. Beatles in the studio. And side one I love a lot. Everything, you know, from Come Together through I Want You, She's So Heavy, which is one of the heaviest songs they ever did. And probably to me, even though I don't play it as often, I... I probably would say Sgt. Pepper as being the best. And, you know, I don't take my opinion so seriously that everybody else has to feel the same way, because mm-hmm. I appreciate and I find it fascinating how Revolver has picked up over the years. And uh, so many um, surveys point to it as number one. And it just goes to show you that people's opinions through time can change. But I think that Sgt. Pepper suffers a bit from burnout from so many years of being praised as the greatest album of all time. And some of those songs are amongst the most played out songs from the Beatles. So I think that the Beatles suffer, that album suffers from that. But I think that, you know, as the Beatles kept on growing, that that leap from Rubber Soul to Revolver was staggering. And I still think that they grew even more in Sgt. Pepper. You know, if you were to make comparisons, and, you know, this is just my opinion here, um, I love Eleanor Rigby to death. You know, I think it's one of the greatest of the Beatles recordings. If you're talking mm-hmm. about classical sounding, uh, you know, McCartney songs, She's Leaving Home is just as great to me. Maybe even better. You know, it's mm-hmm. just one of the most gorgeous songs ever. You know, if you're talking about the psychedelic stuff that John was doing from I'm Only Sleeping to Tomorrow Never Knows, a lot of people think A Day in the Life is one of the greatest, you know, probably the greatest Beatles song ever. You know, and you can also point to Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite and Lucy in the Sky. You know, those are three of the greatest psychedelic songs of all time. You take the Indian music George was doing, Love You Too, was amazing. Within You Without You is is a masterpiece, mm-hmm. in my opinion. You mm-hmm. got the dance hall stuff going from Good Day Sunshine to When I'm 64. They're both brilliant. <laughs> you know, When I'm 64 is amazing too. So it's like, and then when you get to, uh, like, one of my favorite moments in Peppers going from getting better through She's Leaving Home, the three mm. McCartney-dominated songs, although John had a lot to do with She's Leaving Home. But those mm. are just you know, amazing moments right there on record, mm. those three songs back-to-back. Back, you know. So, you know, Sgt. Pepper, to me, probably, in terms of uh, 
the song, the quality of the songs, although, come on, every song on Revolver is great, too. I think it was a little bit better than Revolver, but I'm glad that Revolver is getting the attention that it has. And I do think a lot of it has to do with the fact that once the CDs came out in 1987, everything universally was the way it came out in England. So people around the world heard it the way the Beatles released it. So, you know, as we said, there's a big difference between 11 songs and 14 songs. And when you hear it the way the Beatles released it, as they intended it, um, you appreciate the way their catalog went from song to song and album to album more. With all due respect to Bruce Spizer and how he looks at all the American albums which serve the purpose, you know, when you listen to it the way that the Beatles released it, in that chronological order, you see the growth in a, in a different way. Mm-hmm. Don't okay. you? Agree? I just, I just, I just, yeah. I just, yeah. I just want to make a comment about Eleanor Rigby. I think that's one of the uh, most incredible lyrical masterpieces that Lennon McCartney ever did. I mean, that the the you know when you read those lyrics and the the pictures that 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 ly- those lyrics uh, uh, put together. I mean, that that is just amazing, just absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was listening to Rigby today, um, I was thinking of how you know John used to say, well. Uh, after the Beatles, you know, I just want to write about me and Yoko. I don't want to write about Ziggy Stardust. And mm-hmm. Eleanor Rigby is kind of Ziggy Stardust. I mean, it's a story about someone who isn't John and Yoko, um, right. or Paul and Linda, or mm-hmm. at the time it would have been Jane. Um, you know, it's a story. It's it's simply a creative, um, you know, piece of fiction. And um, you know, as much as uh, John's saying that when he said it had a certain appeal, you know, this is me being real, this is me being me. Mm. There's Rigby, when I was listening to it today, I, I was thinking, you know, there really is something to be said for for sitting down and writing completely out of nowhere, you know, a fantasy story about this this woman's life, you know, all the way through to a, to mm-hmm. to death. Um, yeah. And if you so. couple that if you couple that with the the instrumental track that Ken mentioned before, that's on the the second uh, anthology set. Uh, I mean, that stands that can stand on its own True. as right. a piece as a piece of as a great piece of modern. Uh, Alan, pardon me for saying this, of a piece of modern classical music. Yeah, it works. Yeah, mm-hmm. you could say that about a lot of Beatles songs. Once you just separate, you take the vocals out how fascinating uh-huh. the backing tracks are for a yeah. lot of things. You know, She's Leaving Home by itself without the vocals is beautiful. Right, right. Mm-hmm. You know, so, <laughs> and, you know, I don't want to single out one song. You can say that about a lot of songs. And your bird can sing. <laughs> I do yeah. love hearing that with just, without the vocals. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's tremendous that way. With or without the laughing, Ken? I like both. <laughs> Probably I like it without the laughing more. <laughs> yeah, but the laughing is fun. I mean, I remember the first time you heard that must have been, you know, like, well, this, is, this sounds like they're having a good time. Yeah. And then, um, you know, going back to Revolver versus Pepper, mm-hmm. when you're talking about the Ringo songs, uh, Yellow Submarine versus With a Little Help from My Friends, how do you compare? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. you, know? you know, it's interesting because these the big supposed pan of Sgt. Pepper that the New York Times published in 1967 Mm. Um, basically, you, did, didn't, you didn't write that, right? No, no, that was um, uh, uh, Richard Goldstein, Goldstein right? right? Oh, yeah. yeah, they did exactly what Ken just did, except with the opposite results. I mean, he felt that uh, okay, so she's leaving home is basically just a rewrite of Eleanor Rigby, and that that was that was his issue. He didn't feel that the Beatles were really growing, but I think that, um, and I think he's finally he later in later years came around to see this. Mm-hmm. I think he he kind of didn't quite see the whole picture because you know the 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 comparison Ken did just now of you know. Rigby to she's leaving home and the psychedelic things and the and George's you know love you too to within you without you I mean yeah it's it they may be similar in intent but there is real absolute growth from song to song there Absolutely. and I think that that was a, a good thing to point out I thought hmm. so yeah um, here's another question we only have a few minutes left but we know that Sergeant Pepper 
they debate about whether it was a concept album or not, but at least we know it was a concept in the sense of Paul coming along and saying, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be another band. We're going to, mm. you know, shed our personas and take on this other thing, which will liberate us. And, and then in that sense, Sergeant Pepper was kind of, you know, created as a full piece of work, that, you know, they may not have known at the very beginning the whole shape of it, but it it came together with a revolver. I wonder if you know it, it, it's it's not a concept album in any way, and yet it's an album that hangs together as a unified piece of work in some ways too. I wonder if they just stumbled into that, or whether they had any thought of making a particular kind of album. Any opinions? Well, I was wondering, because uh, I seem to recall, and I might be wrong about this, the first time that I interviewed Mark Lewison, and he was saying to me that even early on, the Beatles were involved with segging songs, you know, the, the you know placing the songs in order on their albums. And I think even Bruce Spicer said to me that didn't really happen until later on, like Sgt. Pepper or something like that. So I think... <laughs> The songs are so strong on Beatle albums that no matter what order you put them in, you'll get used to them in that order, and it makes sense <laughs> once you listen yeah. to it often enough. But I do think that in the case of Sgt. Pepper, though they changed the, the running order, because originally only a northern song was offered, but they they were you know thinking about certain songs flowing you know a certain way, and I don't know if, if that was the case with Revolver. I don't know if any of you know. No, but, it, you know, it seems to have a certain structure anyway. I mean, each side ending with she said, she said in one case and tomorrow never knows in the other. I mean, those those two songs to me, uh, I'm not saying they're similar, but they seem to they seem to reach out to each other in, in, a, in a certain mm -hmm. kind of sonic way or mood way. And, yeah, it, it's. I don't know. I I I, I kind of think that they hadn't really thought much in advance about the album as an album. I mean, maybe they were looking at it and Rubber Soul too. You know, really just as this is a collection of songs we're putting out. Um, it, it's I'd, I'd really be interested to know how they when they began to think of albums as unified pieces of work. You know, as because uh, people made albums differently in those days. It was exactly. Uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Sort yeah. of wondering when the when the change of thought came about, you know. Right. Well, yeah. Because I I think that's a, a mistake that some people make is to you know they uh, labeling the Beatles as an album rock band, and you know and they weren't because they could they could also make these brilliant singles, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think uh, certainly by the time of Revolver. They, I don't think they were really thinking in terms of a kind of a, a unified, a unified work. Just that there were, just the, their, their, their musical, their musical riches. Because obviously, you know, you had three writers who were at that point uh, extremely prolific. You know, this would this would change in 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 John's case. But um, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly at that point he was still you know even even though a lot of them a lot of his songs at that time were very much influenced by his increasing consumption of acid, still mm -hmm. he was still very very prolific. Paul was extremely prolific, and, and uh, the the mere fact that that George Harrison got three songs on this album shows just how much, and that they're also very diverse. Right, three very diverse songs mm -hmm. shows shows just how quickly he was growing as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff Slade, in his article, I think, talks about how John had so many great songs on Rubber Soul that Paul felt competitive, um, mm -hmm. and John seems to have still felt competitive in Revolver as well. Maybe in a, in a certain sense, because by by the time of Pepper, even though John actually did some really great stuff there, by his own account, he was beginning to tune out. But in Revolver, the two of them, are, I mean, that might be really the peak of their competitive songwriting, where they're trying to outdo each other. And when you've got two people of that level of talent trying to outdo each other, it's, it's, it's you know, it could be why Revolver is so consistently great. 
Well, three mm-hmm. people, you know, because George is trying to get in there too. In well, fact, Robert Ro- Robert Rodriguez makes the point that this is kind of like the the last album of what you know, as Mick Jagger called them, the four headed monster. Mm-hmm. You know, when they were all pulling in the same direction for you know one united musical cause and that was that would change after the touring ended and um various other things got in the way i don't know Mm -hmm. if i buy that (laughs) i Mm. really don't i mean you can you can look at certain songs like yesterday which only had one beetle on it or for no one only had paul and ringo on it it's not like every song on revolver has all, all four beetles on it so, right, but you know, they were they were kind of they were still going in the same they were going in the same musical direction, you know, and that would that would begin changing once the touring ended. And you don't think they were that way during Sgt. Pepper? To an extent, no, because because George wasn't nearly as involved with with Sgt. Pepper. That was very much a Lennon McCartney album. Hmm. That's a good point there. And yeah, and that was the the beginning of kind of the uh, uh, the problems, especially between John and George. And uh, you know, it was uh, it, it wasn't quite the same. You know, they weren't quite as much of a united front as they would be as they had had been up to that point. Mm-hmm. And that certainly, and certainly after Sergeant Pepper, that changed considerably over the next two years. Yeah. Could I read one thing before we before we? Mm-hmm. Sure. Because this is something that I read on my live broadcast, and I want to know because I think this is written so well. If you guys agree with this, um, this came from Ultimate Classic Rock, mm-hmm. and it's written by Michael Gallucci. Um, this is a summation of what he thinks about Revolver. He says, If Sgt. Pepper is the Beatles album that certified pop as art, and Rubber Soul is the one that turned the corner on the group's career, and therefore the 60s in general, Revolver is the center on which both classic records and so many more spins. Even its celebrated cover art changed the way album sleeves were perceived. We didn't talk about that. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, more so true. than any other album of their albums, Revolver is the one that sounds less like an artifact and more like a benchmark. Hmm. Not just for the rest of the 60s, but moving forward, rock music in general. The 60s pretty much start here. It's the sound of the future in 35 revolutionary minutes. Those are powerful words to me. So yeah. uh, mm. do you think the 60s started there? No. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Definitely not. And I definitely disagree with him saying it doesn't sound like a relic. Uh, that's not true. I, I I completely disagree with that. But no, uh, I think actually it's held up. You know, musically it's held up very well. Well, it's definitely what I'm what I'm saying is it's definitely the sound of the '60s. I mean, you have to you have to give it that. By the way, that we didn't mention that the the album won two Grammys. Um, Eleanor, Rig- Eleanor Rigby won a Grammy, and the cover won a Grammy. Speaking of the cover, mm-hmm. so, but I mean, it, it, if if an album sound, I mean, Pepper, you know, definitely sounds his sixties, but so does Revolver. I mean, you have to, you have to. I mean, you can't not say say that Revolver doesn't sound sixties. It does. It definitely does. Uh, I mean, Rubber Soul sounds a little more timeless, but not certainly not Revolver. Um, I mean, I'm not and, getting what you're saying here. You don't think mm. Revolver is timeless? Uh, no, I don't actually. I think Revolver is very much a a, a, a product of the '60s, very much. Hmm. Mm. I know a lot of people that would say the Pepper. Yeah, uh, it screams 1967. Yeah, very much so. You know, and uh, it may not sound contemporary to them as much as Revolver does. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people that feel that way in this day and age. Hmm. The people I well, talk to, anyway. Well, I mean, anyway. because of the, the, the uh, because of the, uh, especially because of the, dr- you know, the interaction with the drugs, you know, there's so much, uh, so much of that, that it can't not be, uh, I mean, anybody listening to Tomorrow Never Knows isn't going to say that's a, a 50s song. So, no, I think you have to you have to give it that. 
I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not demeaning the album at all. I'm just saying that that's where it is. You're not knocking it or putting it down or saying that it's <laughs> no. better or greater than Sergeant Pepper is. <laughs> no, no. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's all this. <laughs> right. There we go. That's it's a fact. Per- it's a fact. <laughs> there we go. There okay. We go. Well, we're sort of heading towards the end of our uh show time here and um, I, I, as I suspected it it did turn out to be more interesting than a discussion of Madonna um, <laughs> <laughs> just wait till Madonna year. wait till Madonna covers being for the benefit of Mr. Kite that's all oh god <sighs> <laughs> we haven't you... mentioned Life with the Lions lately hmm. um, haven't no, no but I, I, I think it's ripe for a Madonna cover hmm. <laughs> so anyway um, thanks for listening and uh, you want to get in touch with us you can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com um, we're on twitter at, at things we said fab and um, individually we're all all over the place so shall we start with you Steve Beatles examiner at gmail.com is where you can write to me or you can find me on my own Facebook page with my very own name on it. And you can also join Beatles News and Commentary, the news group I set up, which is growing by leaps and bounds every day. I'm getting four or five people joining up every day. And uh, you're welcome to uh, to join there and talk about talk about news and and uh, and you know react to the stuff. Uh, I post the articles I do there, uh, and you're welcome to react to them. Yeah, lots of lively discussions over there. Yep. So, Al, um, you're heading off to Fest. I will and- be at the uh, at the, the the Chicago Fest for Beatles fans this weekend at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare. Uh, if you're hearing this uh, before uh, before the weekend, please come on out. And if you're uh, if you're in the area, uh, and um, and please and if you are there, please come by and say hello. Knock me down in the hall, whatever you know, whatever you just to get my attention, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> You know, I'll be I'll be, in, I'll be doing a lot of uh, discussion things, uh, assisting Tom Frangione with Name That Tune, um, doing panel discussions and Q and As and various and sundry other things. So please, uh, as I said, come by and uh, come by and say hello. And otherwise, you can get in touch with me. Um, uh, my Facebook. Uh, page is Al Sussman. Uh, Twitter, it would be at ASUSS49 uh, or through uh, Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. The new issue of Beetle Fan should be coming almost any time now with a section, a big section on Revolver, which I believe has a piece from Mr. Cozen, right? Um, I did a piece for him about the love show in Las Vegas. Oh, that's okay. Right. Forty-five hundred words. <laughs> ah, whoa. Right. Okay, and I do a uh, a little kind of scene setter, kind of taking the um, uh, cue from the Change in Times playbook, um, and a kind of a uh, a scene setter on what was what else was going on as Revolver was uh, was coming out. But there is a, a whole section on Revolver in the new issue, uh, which, as I said, will be coming out almost any time now. And I think that's I think I've plugged enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Ken. What have Actually, you got I just going? wanted I just wanted to say since you mentioned the festival, Beatle fans. So many of the people that have been guests on this show are guests there. Mm-hmm. So if you like the shows that we did with Kid O'Toole, Bruce Spicer, um, anyone else? Jude Kessler is Jude going to be there? Yes, Jude okay. will be there. Absolutely. So, so many of the people that were wonderful guests on this show will be there as well. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, my email address is every little thing at att.net. Visit my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Lots of interviews on there with uh, people in Beatle history and lots of Beatle authors, including a new interview I just did with Jude Kessler. And um, Beatles trivia every single week, your chance to win one of nine great prizes um, Mm -hmm. on the Beatles trivia and games page. Anyone can win except my three co-hosts. So... uh, (laughs) 
Ooh. Mm. Ooh. Well, I don't even know if you, if you visit my trivia page. Do you guys? Not okay. I've been there. Okay. I've been there. Do you find the trivia easy or hard? I haven't played it, to be honest. <laughs> well, I like to mix it up and have one challenging one and then an easier one and back and forth. But uh, get lots of uh, great reaction, lots of emails, people trying to figure out the trivia and try to win prizes. So, um, yeah, and my Facebook page is Ken Michaels. You can see a, me... a photo of me with Todd Rungwin. And if you're looking oh, at yeah. my trivia page, don't give the answer. Mm, okay. Um, and I also want to say, if you want to binge listen to our shows, um, just go to uh, uh, yeah YouTube, uh, because uh, I, there's a, if you go to the uh, show page, there's about uh, three dozen shows there. Mm -hmm. um, that you can listen to one after the other, and you don't have to download them; you can just stream them. That was so, a good. That was a good phrase you came up with, Steve. Binge what? listen. Binge listen. Oh. Yeah. There I we go. I never heard that before. Okay. Uh, well, him... now you did. <laughs> there we go. Okay, and you can reach me at my regular Facebook page, which is just Alan Cozen, or my alter ego, which is Alan Cozen Remixed. Actually, my wife set that up. That was supposed to be the nice version of me as opposed to the New York Times music critic version of me. Ah, uh, I like that yeah. idea. Actually. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah, they're pretty similar. So Paula, but... Paula gets the credit for that one? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yay, Paula. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> and so until next week, um, thanks for listening and tune in again. For my three co-hosts, this is Alan Cozen saying see you next time. Mm -hmm.